All right, good morning, folks. It's Steve, Steve Coppard here from Aaron. We're just going to wait a couple of minutes, let a few more people join in, and we will kick off. So for, th for those who've just joined, we're just giving it a minute just to allow a few more people to join in. Okay, I think we'll make a start. So good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Um, my name's Steve, Steve Coppard. I work for Aram and Just. I'm going to run you through a few domestics and then tell you a bit about the session, how it's going to run today, um, and then how you can get involved a bit later on. So domestics, you should be able to see over on the right-hand side, you've got some icons there. You've got the um, event chat, which you can pop comments in if you need to. Just below that, you've got the moderator chat. So Hannah is on standby. Um, if you have any technical issues, you can talk to Hannah. Also, if, if you particularly want to come in at any point before we open it up a bit later on, um, just drop Hannah a line, um, or you should be able to also do it from your, uh, your there should be a little hands up icon. Um, but if, if, you, if you are going to come on and speak, Hannah will send you an invite which you need to accept or you can ask and she can do that for you. Um, we're gonna be recording the session, but we're only publishing my, my, my preamble. Uh, we really want you to be able to speak your mind openly and frankly. Look, Aram has been a, an industry expert for over 20 years. And the reason we wanted to do these sessions is twofold. First, to make sure that everyone's aware of statutory, statutory debt repayment plan and, and what it means for them. And second, um, for those of you know that, uh, who know that I have a, a sort of long background in government, I was very keen that we submit a response to the Treasury consultation. Um, we obviously have our own views, but we're also acutely aware that SDRP won't impact us directly, but it will impact virtually all of our clients, prospective clients and, and partners across the industry. And we're in a kind of a uniquely independent position because we, we won't be impacted directly. And we think it's important that we should be able to represent all sectors, be it public, private or third sector in, in our response. Um, so we've got some, some colleagues today on from, from the advice sector, um, some of whom also very uh, grateful to them for joining us yesterday in the public sector version of this. Um, we're going to run the session in two parts. So first, I just wanted to canter through the main body of the slides. There's a fair bit to take in. I'm, I'm more than happy to send those out afterwards, um, along with my speaking notes. Um, I've, I've, I've tried I've tried not to do the thing where I put too many words on the screen and, and then, then talk you through the words. I, I, I don't like that. Um, the, the first slide is going to be a bit like that, but after that, it won't be. So um, I, I promise you it won't be death by PowerPoint. Um, uh, so we, we're just going to take a look at what the SDRP is, why government thinks it's necessary, what processes are involved, who are the main actors in those processes, eligible debts, priority debts and non-priority. Um, we'll look at the payment allocation rules and a quick, very quick look at some payment profiles. And then there are some call outs that I want to make you aware of. And then I'd really like to open this up to, to your views. And I'll, I'll probably bring in um, a couple of the folks from the advice sector first to kick that off. Um, I, I know that a, a lot of you will have partnerships with, um, with, with the advice sector. And, and so I think it's really important that we all understand what each other's challenges are during this. Um, finally, we're going to be running a few polls throughout the session. Um, Hannah is about to pop up the first one. So as I move on to our, our first slides, you can see now we've popped up on the right hand side. A new poll is live. Please do pop in there and, and give us your thoughts. Right, let's crack on. So as I mentioned, what we want to do today is set out simply what is an otherwise complex consultation um, and to present to you some of the key points that we're Aram think are worth noting. Also really keen to hear your views. Um, so look, the context, you can see it there, but it goes back to the 2017 Conservative Manifesto, um, which had the, the sort of the two components, the breathing space and the SDRP. 
the intent of SDRP was to provide a solution that covers um, people for whom an existing statutory solution such as bankruptcy isn't suitable. Um, in 2018-19, we consulted, so well, we, I keep saying that, I have to stop saying that, sorry, the government consulted on breathing space um, and laid the regulations in 2020. And um, the consultation included the statutory debt repayment plan, but the SDRP regs were delayed until 2021. And, and then, of course, as we've heard a uh, hundred times, COVID happened. Um, so Treasury has now got a current live consultation on SDRP, building off the previous one, and that's accepting written responses until the 5th of August. And I know there have been some roundtable events and bits and pieces that some of you may or may not have been involved in. Um, thankfully, Kevin still over at Dempsa um, is a, a, an incredibly generous collaborator and, and has been keeping us in the loop on some of that stuff as well. So let's just move on to, to the processes, right? So at its most basic level, SDRP comprises three primary processes, and then there are some secondary processes that kick in either periodically or depending on the circumstances. And these processes are executed by four to five participant groups. So the four to five people are the debtor, person in debt, the debt advisor, the payment distributor, the insolvency service, and obviously the creditors. Now that's five, so why am I saying four to five? I'm saying four to five because the payment distributor will either be the insolvency service or it will be a debt advisor. It doesn't necessarily have to be the same debt advisor that set the plan up. So this is where the actors fit in each process. Um, and just to be clear, if somebody's only informed of the outcome of a process, I've left them out here or, or they'd all have everybody in them. I've only put the process operators in place here. And look, I, I wanted to run you through these in a bit more detail. Um, there, there are some unknowns at this stage. I don't think anybody has the entirety of, of what SDRP means in their head, but this will be a, a, a bit talk heavy at, at the moment. So what I'd ask is, if you just sit back and absorb some of the stuff that I've got, I'm going to run through. And like I said, I'm more than happy to send the speaking notes out afterwards. But I just wanted to take you through sort of a, the, the, the process and, and how it works with the people in it. So look, under, under setting up a plan, essentially what will happen is if the debt advisor identifies that SDRP is the most appropriate debt solution for the customer, then the customer completes the application form. And then the debt advisor will issue the notice of intention to the insolvency service. And in turn, the insolvency service notifies creditors and the payment distributor. Once that notice of intention um, has been received, the payment distributors will have to secure payment details from creditors. Creditors are expected, and I'll pause on the word expected, we're gonna talk about that a bit more. They're expected to cease adding charges, interest and stop enforcement action. However, Treasury isn't proposing to legislate for that cessation of action. Um, any creditor who sold a debt or is only acting as an agent, so a, a debt collection agency, for example, must inform the debt advisor of this, and they must also inform the correct creditor that a notice of intention has been received. The debt advisor then will go through the standard financial statement with the customer um, and they submit have to submit a provisional plan to the insolvency service within 21 days of the notice of intention. If there are any amendments that are required, a final plan has to go in within a further seven days. If no plan is received after that, that's that seven day period, the insolvency service will just automatically cancel the notice of intention. Um, Creditors do have a 14 day window to object to the plan, but you need 25% of creditors by debt value to object. Um, in, and if, if you do have 25% by debt value, then it will trigger a fair and reasonable assessment by the insolvency service. Um, if the plan is rejected, then the debt advisor will obviously need to look at um, other options with the customer. But if there's no objection, um, or if the insolvency service finds the plan to be fair and reasonable, it will start immediately, although the customer then has um, 42 days to make the first payment. And probably important to note that silence from creditors will be taken as consent. And then the payments will flow 
from the customer into the payment distributor and out to the creditors. That's that's just your setting up process. It's it's fairly fairly straightforward. Um, then we've got the managing uh, a plan. So once the plan has started, creditors have up to 120 days from the start date to notify the insolvency service of any amendments to debt values. Um, small amendments will be captured um, in the in the first annual review. But any amendment that increases the overall debt value by 10% or more will trigger an in-year review. And we'll talk about the reviews a bit more in a moment. Debt advisor has to review the plan every 12 months to consider the performance and, and any changes in circumstances that may lead to a variation. But likewise, if the customer considers that there's been a material change in year, they can request that the debt advisor conducts a review within 21 days. Where an in-year review takes place, the date of the next annual review will be pushed back by 12 months. So just in, in, in other words, to, to reduce the admin burden, if you had uh, an annual review scheduled for September and the customer asks for an in-year review in July, there's absolutely no point in doing the annual review a couple of months down the line. We wouldn't expect anything to have changed. So it just gets pushed out by, by 12 months. Debt advisors will also be able to trigger a review if they think it's necessary. Um, payment breaks can be requested by the customer and approved by the debt advisor. And those breaks will um, just extend the length of the plan so they get added on to the end of it, essentially. Um, plans, so plans are expected to, to average or to take, you know, no, no more than seven years, um, but they can run out to 10 years which is it was proposed by Treasury to be an exception. What I'm hearing from the advice sector is it's more likely to be the norm rather rather than an exception. <coughs> um, creditors won't be able to uh, object to extensions until the overall length of a plan exceeds 10 years and six months. But creditors can trigger a, a review if they believe then that the, the plan unfairly pre prejudices their, their interests or if they've got reason to believe that the, the debtor isn't eligible for the plan um, or that they've got the money to pay for the debts now, um, or if the, 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 the creditor believes that the debtor hasn't met any of the, the grounds um, of, of, of the plan, um, or, or indeed if the, the amount's been written off, and, and we'll, we'll talk about small value debts in a minute, um, and, and you know there, there are circumstances where that may actually be advantageous. So that was your that was your sort of managing managing a plan. When we come to the end uh, of a plan, a couple of things is so obviously the, the most obvious is is it's all paid up, and where that happens, the insolvency service will notify sorry the, the payment distributor will notice, notify the insolvency service within five days of the final payment, and then the insolvency service will send out a, a notification of a notice of completion to everybody else. If it's not complete. There are a couple of things that can happen. Um, there can be a, a mandatory revocation or a discretionary revocation. So we'll look we'll look at those uh, mandatory first. So with a mandatory rev revocation, it could be uh, simply that the customer passes away. Um, so if the customer dies, then then obviously the debt advisor would, would close that plan down. Um, or the customer could successfully apply for a, for bankruptcy or DRO whilst in the plan. Um, or if all qualifying debts have, have been removed uh, either by the courts or um, at, at, the re at the discretion of the debt advisor during reviews. Um, there's, a, there's a final warning process um, that also has a conditional notice attached to it. So if two final warnings have already been issued and complied with, there won't be a third final warning. Um, and if the conditions arise whereby a third final warning would otherwise have been the appropriate course of action, it results in a mandatory revocation. So, so think of it like a free strikes and you're out rule. Um, the, the DA, the debt advisor can issue a conditional notice and follow that up with a final warning if they think it's appropriate. And if the conditions of the conditional notice are met by the customer, then the plan can continue. Um, but if they don't, then, then the debt advisor can revoke the plan. Uh, so it's, it's just it just just gives a, a little bit of wriggle room for the debt advisor um, rather than just closing the plan down. 
So that was the, the mandatory revocation. And then there's um, a, a discretionary revocation um, where the, the debt advisor if can, can use it if the customer no longer meets the eligibility criteria or if they fail to comply with their obligations, um, if they've not provided the right payment details. Um, I think some of us have, have, have seen, you know, a bit of obfuscation in the past in the collections process. Um, if the uh, if the plan's in arrears um, to the value of either two calendar months or two instalments, because instalments don't need to be monthly under under SDRP, or if it's proven that that the uh, you know the, the the person in debt made a false statement during the application process, or or just if if SDRP is is no longer the appropriate solution. Um, and if the customer can't rectify, the, they'll speak to the debt advisor. If they can't rectify the reason why a discretionary revocation may be um, may, may be imposed, then the plan will be re revoked. But if the customer can rectify that reason, then the debt advisor can issue a conditional notice. And if they don't apply with a conditional notice, then it moves on to a final warning stage, exactly the same as the mandatory revocation. So if the customer gets a conditional notice or a final warning within the preceding 12 months, um, then any subsequent needs to use this process will will skip the conditional notice. In other words, you get that little bit of wriggle room once, but you're not having it every single time. Um, it will go straight to the final warning phase. Once a plan is revoked, creditors are allowed to proceed, but there are different time frames when you can recommence action depending on the circumstances. So, for example, um, if the customer had their plan revoked because they weren't compliant, um, enforcement and the application of interest and fees and charges can start within 14 days. But if, for example, it was a, a joint plan and one of the, the customers has, has passed away, has died, then the other one is allowed to apply for a new SDRP in their own name, but no action may be taken for six weeks um, following the death of the, the other customer. And once a plan is revoked, there is is you're not allowed to have another one for twelve months. The only exception to that being the the, the joint plan where one of the customers has passed away. All right, so let's move on and, and talk a little bit about priority debts um, and and payments. Um, there's there's some stuff in here that that really has me scratching my head. I'll, I'll be honest with you. So priority debts are proposed to be rent or mortgage arrears, although they can be voluntarily excluded. Debts owed to central or local government, but there are exceptions to that. I'll come back and talk about the exceptions in a minute, just, just to move through the list. Gas and electric are included as priority debts. Higher purchase um, is included and contracted Internet service providers and mobile phone networks are also included as as priority debt. Um, so on on a bit about debt owed to central and local government, the exceptions and these are these are really I, I suppose non eligible debts. So it's debts arising from fraud, court fines, and at the moment as well, universal credit overpayments, um, UC advances, student loans. And similarly to breathing space, non-domestic rates and council tax, if the instalments haven't yet fallen due. So if the local authority has, has done the thing whereby they, they've issued the notice and taken away the right to pay by instalments and therefore bring the whole amount due um, immediately, <coughs> then that is considered to be eligible. The, the payment allocation rules, um, and and I know I know Sabrina McCulloch's on the line, so I'll, I'll call out and say thanks, Seb, because this this was this was doing my head in until we had a chat about it last week. So you you, you make you, the customer makes their payment, and ten percent admin fee is taken off, and I'll, I'll talk about the split about where that ten percent goes a bit later. And so so if we were looking at hundred pounds, you've got ninety pound left over, and the ninety pound gets split up and sent to all the various creditors. But then the creditors have to gross that up as if it hadn't been reduced by the 10 percent so you will account for a hundred percent on your books but only 90 percent in your bank that 
that for me it, it causes all sort all sorts of headaches um when we were talking to public sector yesterday we were thinking about council tax and how did you, you have to do a section 13 a write off every every installment um i know from talking to kevin still some some serious concerns around um around reporting to, to credit reference agencies you know how how are we showing it on there um, and I, I'm sure you can all think of a, a, a whole host of reasons why this doesn't feel like a, a, a great idea. But I, I do understand that the Treasury isn't inclined to move on it. So if it is something that we're concerned about, then I, I, I think we need to make to take quite a strong stance across um, our, our responses um, to, to, to really show what, what, how, how we think that's going to be difficult. Um, look, I guess because I'm a bit of a stat, I, I went delving in and, and just uh, so I, I made up. Um, it was on the previous slide. I made up this um, just just a, you know, a a fictional debt book for for a customer, and then ran it forwards um, just to see just to see what it would look like. It's it's not exciting because it's all pro rata, um, and, and you know that that in itself can have its own issues because it does mean that you're you're sort of holding on to priority debt for a long time so i think that debt book was just over four thousand one hundred pounds and i did it as a hundred pound a month payment um and ran it forward over time and what you see is i think it took 40 months for the priority debts to clear and then 47 so another an additional seven months for the non-priority debts to, to to clear out um, and what you do see, because the priority debts get two bites of the cherry, they they get the the thirty percent. Um, going the wrong way, they get the thirty percent um, of of split to them first on a pro rata basis, and then the, the remaining seventy percent goes to all debts, which includes the priority debts. So be, because they're getting two two payments effectively every single month their value drops off their payment values drop off towards the end of a plan you can see that in the bottom graph and then the non-priority debts their their payment value slightly increases over the term but of course you then get to that inevitable spike where the the priority debts are paid off um and and then all the money goes towards the, the non-priority um so i said i was going to say something about about small debts so hmt wants to include them but it's going to be costly to administer. So I, I chucked a £35 mobile phone bill in, into that model and you ended up with 40 instalments all under a, a pound. Um, and just thinking of, of the, the admin burden, of, of the cost of the admin bur burden for that, it, it may drive organisations to, to prefer to write off small debts. Um, but then what's the impact of that going to look like on, on people's credit records, that sort of thing as well? Um, so, so just just something to consider on that. So, just just some call outs now, and and I, I promise I'll, I'm going to shut up in a minute and bring some other people in, so you don't have to keep listening to me all, all for the whole hour. Um, so, in setting up a plan, as I said, 25% of of creditors by debt value need to object. Um, the first payment, uh, potentially 70 days after the notice of intention, you've got the 21 days plus the seven days to do the setup, and then the 42 days that the customer gets to pay to pay the first instalment. Um, so you're, you're pushing out by a couple of months there, just over a couple of months. Um, between the notice of intention and the provisional plan, creditors, collectors, and enforcers are asked to suspend action um but that's not actually legislated for um that 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 kind of worries me so i'm going to ask hannah now uh, hannah could you pop up our second poll please um because on on that point in particular for for, for me I, I worry that it becomes um a, a target that people will will try and get paid instead of going on the plan um, you only need one bad actor on the creditor list to do that, and you only need to have it happen to you a couple of times, and, and it, it just doesn't feel right if we're setting legislation why you wouldn't legislate for that as well. Um, so under our, our sort of managing column there as well, if creditors discover that the debt value is wrong, they've only got 120 20 days to notify the insolvency service. 
I, I I looked at the actual draft regs. I can't I can't work out in there whether there's a limit on payment breaks or not. It it doesn't seem to be. It says that the debt advisor must consider whether a payment break has been uh, uh, there's been a payment break within the preceding twelve months. But it doesn't say that you can't have another one. It just means there has to have been consideration of it. Um, and creditors won't be able to object to those extensions until the plan exceeds ten and a half years. Um, and I, I've literally just mentioned the small debt, so I won't go over that again. And then on the the sort of end of the plan, like I said, we've we've got a free strikes and and your out rule applies. Um, there are different timelines for restarting action um, on SDRPs that have failed or, or depended on um, the circumstances under which they failed or, or were, were paused, stopped. And customers can still apply for bankruptcy or a DRO whilst in a paying SDRP. Um, so just moving on some points to ponder then so consumer credit what happens with consumer credit can the customer still take on debt well yes they can have up to 500 pounds they're only allowed to hold more than 500 pounds with permission from the debt advisor and there is a ceiling on that of 2000 pounds what's not clear to me at the moment is if how and when that will be monitored or assured um, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it, it's not, it's, it's just not clear at this moment in time. Um, so it, it could feel to the customer like they, they could get away with it if nobody's checking. Um, and then it comes up in a, in a credit report and actually their, 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 um, plan fails as a result of that. Um, so I wonder, I wonder about failure demand in the process that a consultation says that payment breaks must be requested and agreed. And it says that you need to give 14 days notice. And it also says that payment breaks are likely to be urgent and unforeseen. Um, pe people's lives aren't, aren't, aren't process driven. Um, people's lives are messy and complicated. And it, it, it worries me when we have this level of operational process laid into legislation because it doesn't allow for real world discretion, doesn't allow for continuous improvement. And it doesn't allow for what real people's lives look like. Um, and because of that three strikes and you're out rule, uh, you know, a, a couple of, of genuine incidents or a lack of availability on the debt advisors part even could lead, lead to people being forced out of SDRPs. Um, because yeah, I I I I just don't believe that there are going to be that many folk who um, are able to give a fourteen day notice window for when something urgent happens and they they need a payment break. So agents, any agent acting on behalf of a creditor must inform the advisor who the creditor is and also inform the the, the creditor the the actual creditor that a notice has been received. Now look again, it's not it's not yet clear who the payment's going to go to on that. So I was thinking about the situation whereby a debt collection agency is collected on behalf of um a, a customer a client. Um so are we saying that the repayment plan with the debt collection agency has to be broken and returned to the client? Um, you know, from, from past experience, I think it's likely that most commercial arrangements would require the client to pay the debt collection agency its commission because it had a, a, a paying repayment plan um, that has had to be broken through no fault of its own. And, and then the client would have to incur the admin burden itself. And look, pr previous, previously when, when, I, when I worked for HMRC, actually, and we, we've moved, we've had to move a load of paying time to pay repayment plans from one debt collection agency to another, we lost nearly 80% of them, ne ne never got them back. I, on policy divergence, um, this is just, just something I was thinking about where you, you've got that, that gray area for, for sole traders and micro businesses, you know, those employing under 10 people, um, whereby Personal and business finances are a little bit more blurred. And on the one hand, government's got a prompt payment code because it recognises that small businesses need to get paid and need to get paid quickly because it's such a risk to them going under if, if they don't get paid. Yet on the other hand, um, it takes priority under SDRP. Um, I guess the, the flip side of that is that enforceable debts, just council tax, will remain in the scheme for longer than, than, for example, if it was a debt management plan. 
where the agent would be able to use their discretion a bit more. He's looking at the mental health, economic abuse sort of aspects of it. Um, there's no mention of how this is going to correlate to a, a mental health crisis breathing space, nor how it will protect victims of domestic abuse, economic abuse. I think we know this is, I think there's, this, I think the stat is that in, in 95% of, of domestic abuse cases, economic abuse is a feature. Um, and so, so yes, uh, you, you've only got to look at the moment, you know, the, the, the sort of the, the promotions that H, HSBC are doing around economic abuse, all the great work that Dr. Dr. Nicola Sharp Jeffs has been doing um, in this space as well. Um, it, it's it's something that's with us now it, and, and it's, you know, it's, it's not a, a niche thing that, that some organisations were thinking about doing something about. It's something we're doing something about now. And it worries me that it's not in the legislation. And then the, the the value for money point was, um, you know, the ten ten percent fees. The, the, so the way the ten percent fee is split, eight percent goes to the debt advisor straight away, one percent goes to the insolvency service straight away, and the other one percent then, um, the other one percent it can either go to the payment distributor or the insolvency service. Sorry, it can go. It goes to the payment distributor, which can be the insolvency service or the debt advisor. Now, look, this is this is lower than what um, the advice sector will receive under fair share, and I, I guess having spent so many years spending public money, the thing I always look for is is what's what's the recourse against poor performance? Are there any SLAs in place? Um, and it, it doesn't look like any of that's been taken into account. So that's us at the end.